um, run school. I'm, I'm kind of interested just, just because um, I, I just found that a fascinating insight into the actual um, ship, the, the scene on the ship itself, where you're there riding in first class um, and, uh, and, and you're having to kind of mix with the other passengers. Um, and, you know, you don't have the social graces or the clothes or anything. But that, I thought that was a wonderful little account. But if, can you just explain what life was like on this ship heading over to Europe? It's funny, I find it a fairly insignificant part of the... <laughs> but if you wish that, I will certainly yeah. talk about it. Um, because the Communist Party in China uh, just had recently come to power, 1949, they in the spirit of internationalism and communism as being an international grouping, they thought they should conduct educational schools for communists living in their region. People before that, in the years before the war, in the 30s and, and, and after the war, the Soviet Union used to take pupils in from other countries, African countries, European countries and Australia. And quite a few people, communists, went from Australia over in groups of 10 or 12 over a few, over a period. So the Chinese said they will set one up as in a, because they respected what the Soviet Union had done and they felt they had the resources and the status and the power to set one up for people in the region. So they, with the help of Ernie Thornton, who was in to do with the World Trade Federation of Unions, he, he was able to instigate a movement for some people to come from Australia. And we were the first group to go there. Mm -hmm. There were subsequently other groups later. Uh, the, there was a new school being built and we then had to go travel there in secret because the Chinese were setting up diplomatic relations with other countries including Australia and other countries, Japan and, and in the region, and they didn't want to be seen to be training people who may be opposed to the governments of that country, because they were not communist countries, they were capitalist countries or whatever. Um, so it was done in secret. This is the sad part about it. Uh, we hadn't no money. The Communist Party of Australia had never had any money and we just relied on donations. Many of us used to give a lot of our income to the Communist Party. When I worked in the factories and things that I used to give about a quarter of my wage, so the sort of thing to do. Uh, so depending on uh, the payments of the fares being paid by uh, probably in money coming from China in US dollars, I don't know. I wasn't party to that, but all I know we went there, 13 of us, who didn't know each other, we come from different states, and there was uh, three women and uh, and ten men. Uh, we gathered in Sydney and boarded the Sorrento, an Italian boat, going to Europe. Uh, Marseille, I think, or I think we got out. Yeah, we got we disembarked. Uh, but on sea, we realised that we are out uh, like fish out of water. We, we had no uh, money to spend. We uh, I didn't know what to do. We took some books with us and I'd sit in the library and read a book. Um, we didn't know uh, other people, other, my group were just trying, to, the couples were okay. There was three couples, but the other of, of us, men, single men, we, there was a, young females and young men on the, and it was a cruise ship, a holiday destination, and you can see the atmosphere. And, and I used to take a book to the library and read it, and, and I, I learned from my colleagues, they, people thought I was a bit odd, I was just going, not mixing with the social life. One of the, our group, a young man who used to be a, a quite a handsome young man from Sydney, he had, he was going out with two girls at the same time. He had two sisters. He, he was kept busy, and I, I had opportunities, but I couldn't take them up. So 
we had a strange thing. We couldn't spend money on it, drinks, and take them and, and as you would on socialising. And that's how it's done on the ship, the Surya. And the, the worst thing was we were concerned. We realised that the crew were depending on tips from the passengers. They were very poorly paid. And they, uh, they were very challenged crew. Mm. They're very sympathetic. They realised, we thought we were young people going to a, a festival, a peace festival, mm. was being held in Europe. And they realised we were not the ordinary tourist. Mm. Uh, so we were, and, and they sympathised with us, but we couldn't help them financially by donating and tipping. So we avoided a lot of those occasions. Mm. So it was a bit uh, unfortunate journey. Uh, uh, cross there, we couldn't in, uh, enjoy it as, as it wasn't a tourist uh, holiday for us, it was a serious business for us mm -hmm. and we tried to keep it secret and unfortunately we had to keep it secret from our families. Yeah, what an extraordinary thing. It was terrible, I had to tell my mum and dad I'm going away for a few years, I can't tell you where I'm going or what I'm doing. Now that's most uh, unlikely to ever happen in people's lives mm -hmm. unless they're being imprisoned or going off to war. Uh, we were we were saying well, I'm going away. We're going overseas. I can't tell you where I'm going. The party said they would be in touch with my mum and dad. I was the only one at home then. Mm. My other siblings had left home, and I was working on the waterfront and I was contributing to the house. Of course, mm. mum and dad were probably better off than they had been, mm. and I had to give that up. And depending on my sisters who lived in the countryside on dairy farms, and they were great supportive. They I left my parents in North Carlton and the understanding that the rent had be looked after by the party. I don't know how it worked, but my sister finished up taking them to a cottage in their farm in the Western District later. Uh, but I didn't party, know that. The party didn't? No, we didn't. I don't think they kept up with the correspondence and things, but they didn't hear from myself for months, or, mm. and I didn't get a letter for a year or something. Mm. It was a shocking thing. Mm. Uh, and, um, and they... I don't know how they felt, but they, re they said, my mother said to me, well, I know that you, what you're doing won't do any, you will do, do good, not harm. Uh, she was that word she said to me. But um, so when we went, that was, a, uh, that was difficult. The boat trip was, to me was a necessity to go to get to Europe. We had to then secretly go from Europe, uh, Maasai, to, uh, we got to Czechoslovakia. Yeah. I was going to ask about that because, interestingly enough, you were being tended to by Slansky, who was then... Um, by who? Slansky. Slansky, the communist in Prague. Who yes. Was, who was later ex trialled and executed. Yes. Um, and we we um, learned about the Slansky trials in history at school, and it was interesting reading I that see. he was the very person that you were... Um, dealing with in Prague? We, well, I didn't know who we were dealing with. We, yeah. We're dealing with the Communist Party. What happened, the Communist Party in different countries had to help move us from one country to the other. And there was a lot of uh, bureaucracy and a lot of problems going on between these countries. Mm -hmm. And so we were delayed for about a, a month in Prague, if my memory's right. Uh, and then we eventually got to uh, Moscow. Mm -hmm. And then we had uh, there was delay because of these internal conflicts that you were alluding to. Mm. I didn't know who was involved in the communist leadership at the time. We weren't party to that. Mm. And, and don't forget also we weren't party to, we had a leader of our group and we, as members we weren't told a lot of things. It wasn't an open shop and mm. you don't just talk, didn't talk freely. It was sort of, you didn't need to know, you weren't told. You know. mm. um, then we went to Moscow and then they put us on the Trans-Siberian Railway, an old Karis coach, and oh, it, uh, yeah. but yeah, yeah, and it went from Moscow to Vladivostok, through Vladivostok, to the point of Chinese border. It took about ten days, ten nights, uh, and we just had we looked after. It was all uh, at cost to the countries, to the parties, and we were treated specially mm. as important communists. We were just ordinary communist people, but in there they looked upon us as future leaders. In fact, the talk was if we the Communist Party was banned in in Australia, we were going to be a back stop or a, 
of, of future leaders that could be, we, we, it wasn't put to us quite crudely as that, but that was what was suggested, that we could be a, a force so that could be helped if it goes underground. Yeah. If it goes underground, or if you were exiled, for example, were you, were you, were you faced with that idea? That you Not being exiled, we thought of being, when we returned, being imprisoned, okay. if you looked at the worst scenario. If the Communist Party was outlawed, yeah. well, we were over there. They had the referendum, yeah. mm -hmm. and by a very narrow mo minority, majority, yeah, ma minority, it was de defeated. It was mm -hmm. no, no vote came through. Not it was very close. Mm. Uh, so it was almost being banned, and we were predicted that we were going to be uh, banned. Mm. And then we realised we were studying the history of other countries in Europe that had been banned, and what you do, you copy German methods of how do you communicate. Uh, in, underground, and not, not no, no, no many people, not too many people knowing where you were and what you were doing, and having so small cells. cells. cells yeah. So we're setting up small cells, mm -hmm. and it was we, we had it and before I left. It was talked about here, and in the Carlton branch, it was going to have another secret branch by a few people. Uh, I didn't go into that though. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you um, eventually arrive in. Um, in Peking, as yes. it was then, and you found out you were six months too early. Yes, uh, the building hadn't been completed. There was a new building uh, out just out of Peking, uh, uh, and, and at that time, you must remember they were putting up new buildings they badly needed. Infrastructure was needed badly, and we uh, went to live in a, a, an old mansion that was uh, owned by a wealthy. A Chinese man who was dispossessed, uh, and it was in one of those lovely places. If you were very wealthy, you could imagine walking into a uh, down a passageway, laneway of mud walls, and into a courtyard. And then, in you go in the courtyard, you go for a nice uh, through another garden into a building, and then you go to another courtyard and another building. and and it was just, uh, and we we took, occupied that for a while. We we had our interpreters, our, our lecturers, people would come, uh, help us, and, and so we were settled in for six months there. Mm. And we did some studies, yeah. Mm. And you were given uniforms to wear. Yeah, we gave the same uniforms as the Chinese were wearing, uh, the black mark male suits they call them. Like uh, uh, they were, we were, we got Chinese names. Uh, my name was Chu Tien, uh, which is very appropriately is called Heavenly Peace. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. He uh, Chu Tien, I was told it's Heavenly Peace. I'm going to accept that. Uh, so then we call each other by our Chinese names. And the, the sadness of it, again, not being able to tell our people where we were and what we're doing, we couldn't ask each other who our backgrounds. Mm. Now, you have a group of people who go away together, you'd imagine, and we meet someone's from Brisbane, someone from Adelaide. Uh, what did you do? You couldn't ask those questions. It was such a secretive time that in case somebody left and revealed who was who and who was who. Mm. Uh, I might add at this stage that ASIO didn't know what was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, they thought we were going to a youth group. They knew that these communists were disappearing. I was not that well known. Mm -hmm. Some of the other people were mm -hmm. well known communists in different states. Uh, I can tell you now that recently uh, a book's been written by uh, Mark Ahrens. Uh, okay, he's one of the Ahrens family, uh, well known communist, grandfather, father, son, mm -hmm. sons. Uh, Eric was our leader, Eric Aarons. Okay, Mark's his brother, or uncle, I'm not sure. Better correct me on that. Um, he wrote a book about the, uh, ASIO having these files. And I've got the title of the book. It's come out a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about the files. that They have the most examined people in Australia are the Aarons family. Yeah. Okay. And in that book, uh, they look at Eric... Aaron's is one of the communists is being investigated. Um, they didn't know where he was, and only after they read the Asia read my book, well, that I mentioned where we were, 
that Marx writes in his book that he's reading this about Eric being in China and doing these studies. And he and said, I've read this before. Wow. And he said, I've read this before. And they picked it out of my book. Right. So that ASIO had to rely on my story right. to, because they didn't know. So, they, so, they, so, so this CPA successfully... Yes, that's right, yeah. precisely. Yeah, yeah. And it, it was not a big deal. We didn't... We were doing it secretly, not for the ASIO. Yeah. We were doing it because the Chinese, as far as I could see it, yeah. my reasoning, mm. that it embarrassed the Chinese. Mm. If they get up establishing diplomatic relations with Australia, and like someone gets up in Parliament and says, well, you're training these... Sub mm. The RSL called the subversives mm. Mm. Uh, and, and treacherous people in the RSL journal. Mm. So, the, uh, so, the, so we weren't worried. It right? didn't matter if ASIO knew. I didn't worry me, uh, uh, people, what we were doing was not, we weren't studying armed struggle. Mm. We didn't go there to learn armaments or terrorist tactics or, mm. uh, we, we, we weren't training, we were going there to be educated. Yeah. And, and I made that point in my book that RSL did uh, wrongly saying we were being trained, we were being subversive and trained to, to do these things. Mm. And, and the ASIO didn't know this and when they quoted uh, Mark Aaron's quotes, and if you've got his book, you'll see quotes that they weren't about it from what he'd read in my book. Mm -hmm. So my book, I thought, was important to write, not as a critique of the Communist Party, which I needed to criticise, and needed criticising, mm -hmm. or you can say worse, <laughs> but uh, it, it just let them people know what, what we're on about mm -hmm. uh, and what the whole purpose of, of, of the Communist Party was and what we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought it was, it was a justifiable, uh, credible critique of the Communist Party. The headings on the book are wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, there was not, uh, they presented it in the way of selling the book. Yeah. But it was never my intention. When I went to a broadcast at, at Brisbane, when I launched the book, I had to correct a few of the messages I was sending out, that mm -hmm. journalists were putting out about that, that I was being victimised, being terrorised, or. Uh, threatened, uh, those things were untrue and I made it quite publicly clear that I wasn't being mm -hmm. subject to any abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another story, but yeah. uh, that's a, sorry. So, in, so in, uh, in China you are um, educated in this quite laborious fashion where you have someone speaking in Russian being translated into Chinese, which is then being translated into English. Um, I, I was reading in your um, book about the translation process as you're being educated. So how, and, and that you were doing these really long days. So can you just tell us a bit about the actual studies you were doing? Yes, certainly. Uh, the, 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 would be, the Chinese thought they should have Russian professors uh, and to help them set up the subjects. And so you had people coming from, the, by the time, by that time there was a, a lot of Russian uh, tech, technical people setting helping set up enterprises uh, at that time because uh, Chinese needed development there and uh, so they came out as they used to, children used to call them Soviet uncles you know uh, quite affectionately uh, the we had the professors coming out and they would t uh, they relied on the Chinese interpreters who may ha who some of them did interpret from Chinese to English to help us, but some of them were able to go straight from Russian to uh, English. Oh, right. So we, some of these talented Chinese people, uh, young people, they were, were so wonderful. They did that, and we. So, but what the Soviet professors would lecture, uh, and we would have the some of the material they were lecturing on, uh, was word for word what we were reading in our English translations we'd brought with us. So it was a bit mm, unfortunate. Uh, I felt sorry for the uh, Russian lecturers. I learnt later that they were frightened of Stalin. Mm. Uh, they were frightened if they made a, an error, that they would lose their head. Mm. Uh, Stalin used to talk about shortening people by their heads, mm, mm. taking off their heads. And that was crudely put, but they were worried, and I didn't know at the time they were worried. So it's that's sort of, why they were reading it. Word, word for word. They wouldn't make one word would not be changed. And then the Chinese lecturers would come straight from China to English, of course. 
uh, and we, we were getting the basic round of teachings of uh, Marxism uh, and, and, uh, and political economy. Uh, we'd get that from the Russians uh, and the Chinese. Would, we were influenced more by their teachings on what we called method of leadership. And the fundamental change was in that area of the methods of leadership and it influenced us so much so we tried to introduce it to Australia when we got back and that's another story. Uh, but the, briefly what we learnt from the Chi we learnt about the Chinese, the lecturers would, might be from the PLA, People's Liberation Army, and they might tell us about their 20 years of fighting uh, the Japanese fighting for independence of China and, the, the, and how they'd won over the peasantry and the people and their methods of winning over the people through what they call a mass line. They had different terminologies for it, but basically it meant that listening to the people and listening to uh, what they thought about an issue, what they wanted, and then by the winning leadership methods of incorporating as much as they could and uh, putting forward policies that, which reflected that f general feeling of what should be done, whether it was for land for the peasants, naturally independence for China, and fighting the Kuomintang, who were very bad treatment of the soldiers, of Kuomintang, and treatment of the villagers and the peasants. And the Chinese, when they went to a village, they stressed that they wouldn't, would be very respectful to the people. They wouldn't take any grain unless they paid for it. They, if they stayed in the villagers' huts, they'd sweep the floors and do the chores that were done. And they were, they, they were, that was a whole, with many exceptions, no doubt, but that was the method that the PLA won over, mm -hmm. uh, supported the people and they were to get the, uh, they were, you know, they felt they were uh, fish swimming in the sea of the people and they were, and that was very, very well explained to us and by personal examples a young man might say I've been 20 years in the army I haven't been back to my village yet mm. I've been fighting this and I've done been there and now I'm doing this and that was a sacrifice mm. and they made us feel very humble mm. they were giving up so much and we were doing our introspections about what how we failed in our activities they were giving their lives and leaving their families behind so it was a different world and it was very moving for us, mm. uh, inspirational, if you like. And so they then, they, we learnt a lot from the, the, more from the Chinese lecturers and their stories and their material. We read a, a lot of uh, Mao Zedong's books mm -hmm. of how uh, on practice or on contradictions, you maybe have read them, uh, how to uh, look at the uh, uh, contradictions and how to resolve them and, and how he was very famously explained how the guerrilla, guerrilla warfare tactics of how to defeat the many with a few, and those those things didn't really impact on us because we had no occasion to want to engage in armed uh, activities. But for some of the other people there from other countries, whether like they be from Indonesia, Burma, uh, uh, Japan, or not so much Japan, but other other countries, uh, they would probably find that. Uh, that very in, informative, yeah. yeah. But it was mainly based on theory, and uh, mm. and and that's that was what the school was about. And so, mm. the big impact we had on us was a book by Lu Xiaoqi by How to Be a Good Communist, and that was he went into detail to what made a good communist, and we all aspired to be a good communist. I wanted to be a good communist, so I uh, read that carefully, and it was mainly how to. Uh, how to be uh, practice the mass line, uh, how to approach people, and and are very strict about being a leader. If one of our members of our group said, "I want to be a leader," I always want to be a leader. They would be so that's wrong. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't want to be a leader. You should want to be a a, a worker, a fighter. Mm -hmm. And if you were elected to become a leader, well, that's that follows on. But you shouldn't aspire to be. A, a leader. So they were very strict on those sort of things, and it was almost uh, done it almost like in a, in a religious atmosphere. Mm, mm. Uh, and uh, I found that very moving. I related to it. Mm. I, I could absorb it, and, and I could uh, I like to think I could practice it. Mm. So, Can you just explain a little bit about 
those introspections, what did that mean? Yeah, sure. Do you need more yeah. of a glass of water? No, it's all right, thanks. Okay. The Chinese used to say when we went there that they've got to cut off our bourgeois tails. We, we, growing up in a capitalist society, we imbibe capitalist ways of acting and thinking. Uh, and of course it's so strong in our country, uh, people aspire to uh, personal wealth. Mm. Uh, and uh, apart from aspiring to be good uh, in their academic fields uh, and their, in their uh, science, and in their sporting events, they do hold a thing. We build up uh, getting rich and being uh, uh, wealth and uh, having um, acquiring property. And private property, of course, looms very large in our capitalist society. Mm. Uh, something that I've always rejected personally, mm. but they, apart from personal homes, mm. but we're talking private property too, and particularly if you're employing labour. Employing, uh, okay. Um, so they were brought up about. They've got a couple cut off our capitalist tails. So what that means, you've got to examine yourself, introspection. Uh, so what what it means, you just don't. Uh, you've got to have a theme. You've got to have a, a, a project. So you 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 do an introspection of how I can be, how I wasn't a good communist, how I how I failed in my uh, to bring about the uh, supporting the workers or the peasants or whatever or following issues and how I didn't carry out, uh, didn't devote my time and my thoughts to, to guiding. See, the communists then had a, a, a basic belief. You might say an almost an arrogant belief, goes back in the time of, uh, since uh, Stalin, before Stalin, that we were the vanguard of the workers. The communists were the vanguard. The other parties were reformists and they were traitors and we were the true vanguard. So we promoted ourselves and Stalin encouraged that. You are a people of a special mould. Mm. You are the vanguard of the working people. And so communists had to then say, well, at the, again, if you like to like a priest, he has to be leader of his flock and, mm. and, and so on. So the communists had to, the vanguard, they had to work, lead the workers. Mm. Whether the workers wanted to be led or not, <laughs> the communists had to, were there to lead them. And we had good intentions. We, how self-righteous we were, I won't go into that. But that was, that was what the vanguard was. So we then had to do introspections to see how we failed of being in the vanguard, being worthy of being in the vanguard of the working people and guiding them to socialism, to a peaceful, harmonious world. That was sort of a and utopia that was almost. An example but, of a... Okay, well, we had to give examples. Well, we weren't able to give many examples. They were pretty rough and ready. And I mentioned it in this tape you got. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll get. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, one example, someone might say, I'm thinking of a party organiser in Sydney, he would say, uh, oh, look, I, I was very bad one week. I, I didn't go to the tent of the factory I should have gone to or see some workers. I went and I spent my time lying on the beach. <laughs> now, this is very simple. Uh, uh, very simple thing, um, every day sort of thing that happened. They didn't get into, uh, they, uh, failing of our group, we didn't get into enough where we went wrong on policies. We, we, we had a, they didn't say, for example, we had a strike, we encouraged the coal miners to go and strike at the time of the Chifley government. Mm. And we didn't, uh, uh, we caused havoc among the working people and divided the working people. And that was wrong. We didn't, didn't have that depth they were personal. Our things weren't able to bring out. We were younger. We weren't in the, the top union leaders or party leaders. Mm. And, and they were very much uh, the top of the leaders that were more likely to hide it too. Mm. They're not wanting to reveal. It was be like pulling teeth mm. from those people. So a lot of them wouldn't say much of what they did. I just, I might give examples of some things I, I did wrongly. I might have said I done something that I'm trying to think what examples I might have given that was quite a, a wrong tactics or wrong behaviour uh, and you try to bring out examples from your life of your working your party life of where you did the wrong thing uh, and the wrong thing being that you didn't carry out party policy or you, you devoted too much time to yourself I think it was the theme was generally to 
take over your self-interest, to eliminate self-interest and the party interest, was almost asking a lot from people, almost impossible to be to do it. But that's what they're on about. And some of the other countries, I remember there was a, a, a young man from a very fine name I could talk to. We couldn't talk to our neighbouring students because of the language barrier, mm. but they, they didn't want you to. Mm. Didn't want you to know about this person from India mm. in case you revealed yeah. something that might cause him to lose his life or yeah. be imprisoned mm. if he went back, when he goes back. Mm. Uh, so there was a talk about I uh, talking to this Burmese man and he was very upset doing his introspections, it went on for months and months, uh, about he killed, when he's in the British Army, he killed some communists. And then he joins the Communist Party and now he's got to re reveal this. Mm. And so I think he was the one that committed suicide. Some, see, those sort of things happened, not in a big scale, mm. but it did happen. Mm. Uh, so it was, it was a very painful process and, and it was, uh, you could, it, it was bordering on psychological yeah. uh, remoulding of the mind. Mm. Uh, they called it remoulding, but it had to be done skillfully and carefully. Otherwise, it could get into a. Uh, your colleagues could ask you. You go to. You write out your introspection, mm. and you'd go to your group meeting, maybe half a dozen of you, and you'd read each other's uh, comments, uh, thoughts, and you'd ask to give an opinion on them. Mm. So you're actually encouraging the person, not in a vindictive way, mm. but in a way of trying to encourage them to go deeper and really reveal uh, their mistakes. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm a great believer in learning by mistakes and uh, I, I feel today that if only our government leaders would admit their mistakes uh, instead of concealing them, not just government leaders but other people. Mm. But anyway, we, we were trying, I didn't find it that difficult I didn't, I didn't lose many sleepless nights. I did what I could think of about what I should have been doing and didn't do. Mm. I didn't have grave errors to overcome, I don't think. But someone uh, like this Burmese guy is obviously tortured by it. Yeah, some of them were. They, yeah. they were, they were not, they were, and we didn't know to what extent. Mm. Uh, I don't know how it worked out, but all I can say to you, in our time, it went on for months. Mm. Um, and it would, it, it, people weren't, and the Chinese leaders would say, yes, you, don't have, you do have sleepless nights. They believed it was uh, beneficial to do it. And, and I think the general theme was good, but very concerning. Uh, and when we got back and I tried to bring in methods of leadership into the Victorian Communist Party, Vic, the Hill, Ted Hill, the secretary, was very uh, anti uh, any anti this idea, he thought it was psychological mumbo jumbo or something, and he 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 was a leader who didn't want to face up to errors. Mm. A lot of the leaders in in the Communist Party, and no doubt in other parties, would not face up to their no. the errors in policies, in tactics, mm. and be, behaviour. They wouldn't do that. They didn't want to. They felt they might be belittling themselves. Mm. They might have felt it was damaging the party, but it was purely self, basically got down to self-protection mm. or self-interest. And we, they were trying to get us to ride above our self-interest self yeah. into the party in, interests yeah. the party. Mm. Just, just on Ted Hill, um, so he, he ended up being a, in a very small group of people who was basically running the show, didn't he, in the Australian Communist Party. So there was a group of you who ended up being in a, an internal struggle for democracy within the party. Can you talk a bit more about that? It's a bit, bit complicated. Mm. Not long after we were back, the other groups went over and they learned a bit more about the Chinese methods and it was mainly, a, the difference showed up starkly was the methods of leadership. Mm. The, what was like a commandism method that the Hill and these people used, they worked out policies and pushed it down to the people of the party members. They didn't in set out discuss with party members and workers what's the best policies and work from there upwards. They called it the mass line. They were working down, leadership down. Leadership has the knowledge, has the whatever. And he didn't like this, idea. Hill didn't like this method. And he, I, 
had the occasion to uh, uh, accidentally meet with three other people. Uh, we, we were critical of, uh, we'd been to China, yes, and different times, and we had the methods, and we felt that the leadership in Victoria, <coughs> and not leaving aside Australia, was, was not good. And I had to, one occasion, when we, four of us had this, um, over two years, we raised issues and we got nowhere. And I had to, it, to bring it to a head, I had to get up at a state committee meeting and uh, criticise Ted Hill. Uh, that's documented in the book, uh, not in detail. It hadn't been done before that you'd do that and it caused havoc. And 